these things happen periodically. And as Christians, we've been learning. So you grab your notes, grab your Bible, whatever you need to grab to take some information down. I try to stay in a position as a pastor to give you information that is pertinent or helps you in your daily life. So our sermons, our briefings here are designed to give you information and knowledge so that you can put it to practice and overcome the daily issues that often we have. How many here could use better grades? How many here could use a little more favor in the neighborhood, maybe with friends? How many here could possibly use just to be kind of given your quiet space and enough time to think about all the stuff that's going on? These are confusion, confusion times. These are times of pain and suffering. But you know what? God has a plan for you and I that goes beyond what the world has to offer us. All right, so let's go in. We've been doing a Truth About series, and for everybody that's new, we've been talking about several items. One of the truths that we need to know is our eyes have to be on whom? Jesus. The scripture says, looking unto Jesus, he's the author and the finisher of our faith. But oftentimes, because we're humans, our eyes sometimes are in many different places except Jesus. And so I'm going to encourage you to understand that the scripture describes a place where you and I can dwell, where you and I are as Christians, where the enemy cannot touch you, nor can he play with your mind, and where God can begin to help you overcome the Beggarly elements of this world, no matter how young you are, no matter how old we are, he's causing us to have victory in the midst of a storm. But it's what we do with what we know that makes us wise. It's what we do with what God gives us to know, what we practice produces wisdom and results. How many has ever gone to school, you studied, you studied, and it didn't get a grade good enough that really matched the study that you studied? Of course, I did. And I was always one of these people that uh, waited till the last minute to do my homework and study for the test. Now, I don't want you to put your hand up in the air. I can identify with that. I was always probably just the mi middle person of my class. But let me tell you something. God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us that is not middle of the road, that is not average, but it's above average, that it's of God's quality, and it abides. If you said, Jesus, come into my heart, I surrender, be my Lord and Savior, then God came into your heart and made you exceptional in your heart. Now, you might not feel exceptional in your flesh, in the physical realm, but God considers you exceptional to him because he gave his love in the expression of Jesus Christ so that we could receive him and that he could totally receive us. Amen. Folks, in our earthly parents, sometimes we have to clean our room, we have to do our homework, we have to do those things. But with God, God says, you can do all those things, but you're going to lose your joy you're going to get frustrated, but if you ask me to help you, I will teach you how to do it my way where there's little stress and little pain. Can you say amen? Now, you take that and you move it over into adulthood where we have to go through things that adult people seem to go through. While we were children, younger, I loved the grace my parents gave me. They dwelling in the house, that means I had access to the fridge. I had access to sleeping in the morning, except for school time. But I want to tell you, you have a heavenly father that has given you access to things and a protection over you beyond your wildest imaginations. So we need to consult what the word says concerning who we are in Christ. Can you say amen? So today's teaching is being complete in him. Amen. So welcome to the briefing. We have studied about 
putting their eyes on Jesus, keeping them off the world, keeping them off other people. How many's ever had a friend maybe let you down and your heart was broken? You see, we don't put our hope and our, and our eyes on people to give us joy because people are make mistakes. So we put our eyes on Jesus who never makes a mistake. And then when we have friends, even if they do right or they do wrong, we're not affected in such a way that it ruins our day. Someone say amen. amen. But at the same time, think about it when we grow and we develop. So as we study, we found out that we keep our eyes off the world, we keep our eyes off of others. And this is the one that we really got to work on. We keep our eyes off ourselves. Everyone, keep my eyes off myself, right? Poor me. I never get anything. I'm never going to mount anything. Where's that eye on? Me. And how many know when, when we're feeling that way, nothing gets done? Everybody wants to get away from you because you're a misery sitting on two legs or standing on two legs. So let's look into this thing. Let's find out. Here's some things that we know. Number one, we grow in four ways. Everyone say four ways. Four ways. We grow in height. We grow in breadth. We grow in depth. And we grow in Fear. length. Here's what. Not for, yeah, that's okay, Seth. That's all right. This is, this is a family. It's, it's no problem. So like a tree, it grows deep for stability it grows up for upreach, it grows out for maturity, and it grows on a space of time for longevity. So you grow the same way. You're going to live a certain amount of time. And so God says, you take your life and you turn it over to me. I will teach you to be the best that you can be and that you'll excel where if you did it on your own, you wouldn't. Amen. So we found out to develop we need to do four basic things. We need, need to meet with God on a regular basis. I say to the body here, meet with God first thing in the morning. It'll take us a few minutes. Clear everything. Make sure everything's taken care of so you start the day fresh. Two, we need to spend time in his word. We need enough word so we can get our mind quieted and focus on what is right and not all the confusion that's out there. Three, we need a good time of praise and worship. Why? Because that teaches us humility. You know, it really takes a humble person to worship God. Amen? And if you're finding it's easy for you to worship God, then you found humility. And God says, blessed are the humble because I will exalt them. But see, it's really hard because... We're learning to realize that our body, our physical body, and our emotions are not what should control us. Can you say amen? amen? But rather, it should be the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. We should line up what we feel, how we see, how we analyze things with the Scripture to make sure we're not opening doors where the enemy is going to give us a, a black eye. Believe me, he doesn't deal in black eyes too much. But he does put bruises on the head. You come on. Amen. Amen. We've all been through a knock through situations, and it doesn't matter how old, how young, we all go through opposition because there's an enemy in this planet. He's got your name. He hates you because you're made in God's image and after God's likeness. Now, you didn't ask to be born in this world, but you are still here. So listen, if you're drowning, grab the life preserver. Don't sit around and argue whether you should or not. Right? Right? So, Chris, now listen, Christianity is not a religion. So throw that out. Christianity is God reaching to us, not us reaching to God. Every religion in the world is man trying to be better and trying to reach to God. But, you know, my Bible says God so loved the world that he came to where we were and he loved us. And he said, here I am, accept me. Now, I want to tell you that little lie that we get into our mind. Oh, you don't want to do that. Your friends are going to hate you if you accept Jesus. Or you're going to be one of those religious people who wear sandals and walk around in a robe. You've got to realize I'm an old hippie, junkie, 
rock and roll freak. And you know, God got my attention. And you know how he got my attention? By his glory and his power. He did it because I didn't hear religious preaching. You better, you better, you watch out, you watch out. I heard how to do things so that God and I could become an overcomer. You can't do it on your own, so Jesus says, hook up with me. Hook up with me, learn from me, for I'm meek and I'm gentle, and you'll find rest to your souls. And then when you find rest to your souls, allow me to guide your life, and I'll lay out your steps so that the things that you do are more successful and not pain and suffering and mistakes. Someone say amen. amen. The second key I want to give you is we develop and become stable when we spend time with God and time in his word. Say amen. amen. It doesn't happen any other way because probably we suffer with the same thing as I suffer with and if I lean to my own thinking, understanding, because it doesn't have all of the facts I sometimes can make bad decisions because I don't have all the facts. Can you say amen? amen? You're thinking somebody doesn't like me anymore, but I've not found out the facts. I go over and say, why don't you like me? And they go, I never said I didn't like you. To avoid silly things like that, that's how the enemy plays his game. Everybody tap your forehead and say, he plays the game in my mind. So, if you hear a voice that sounds like you, that tells you, you you're no good, you did it now, you're just a screw up, you're never going to amount to anything, that's the enemy suggesting and telling you, you are not doing well. God will never tell you, you're not doing well. Did you know that? Never. Well, he did it in the Old Testament. Don't you understand the Old Testament versus the New? How many here would like to look a little Bible lesson? In the Old Testament, did they have Jesus? Yes, they did. But he hadn't died and rose again. Now listen, you need to understand that. But because he didn't die and rose again, so nobody had God living in them in the Old Testament. They had God working with them. So can you imagine how some Christians can be with God in them and they can still misbehave how bad it was in the Old Testament when they didn't have God in them, they only had God with them? Look at Samson. Mighty man, he was doing all that. And then some woman came along, cut his hair, and he became a wimp. So all of those counts in the Old Testament, they're actually exciting. Because, but you got to read the Old Testament in the realization that they didn't have God in them. They only had God working with them. So they had to buddy up with God all the time in order to get God's will to be done in the earth. Now in the New Testament, Jesus died and rose again. So when we accept him, we get everything that Jesus accomplished when he said it is finished. So you're a different kind of believer in the New Testament than the people in the Old Testament. Why? You have God living in you. Amen. Everyone say, I have God living in me. I asked him to come in. And I'm very pleased that I did. Now, you think about it. We're going to be teaching you how that you're complete in him. If you have God living on the inside of you, let's break it down. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry, inside of me? Well, you are three parts. Everyone say three parts. Poke your neighbor. Go ahead. I want to get everybody. Three parts. You are a three-person being. You're a spirit. You have a soul. And you live in a body. Say that with me. I'm a spirit. I have a soul. And I live in a body. Now if this sounds Greek to you, just listen. Your spirit is all the life. Makes your heart beat, your lungs work. It's the driving force where God dwells inside of you. Now your soul is your personality. How many know everybody has different personalities? Your soul is your will, your mind, your emotions. It's the things you like to do inside that God put. Some people like to paint. Some people like to play music. Some people like to, to write. Some people like to just have fun. It's inside of you already. But this flesh is not good. It will tell you and suggest for you to do things you know you shouldn't. 
So what do we do, Pastor Gary? You meet with God and say, God, help me to crucify this today. Fill me with all that you have for me today. So that when you get up from that moment of prayer, it only has to be 10, 15 minutes talking to God, surrendering to God. You, you get up and it's like a new charge in your phone. It's like your computer's been rebooted. Can you say amen? It's like you, you've been to the filling station and you've been gassed up. You've been, all your fluids have been checked. But you have to meet with God first. Why? Because says if God says, if you put me at the top of your first list, I will lift you up on the top of my first list. Hello. As you sow, so shall you reap. So what does the devil do? He gets you mad at somebody. And you say a bunch of nasty things. And you did that. And you really don't mean it, but you're just doing what everybody does. You're going to have to answer for all of that. So rather just going off and not controlling yourself, if you would have met with God the first thing of the day, people won't irritate you as much. Wouldn't that be great? Come on, say amen. amen. People won't get to you. Situations won't get to you. When the bills come in and says you got to believe God for this because you don't have any cash in your... God takes care of that, but you've got to put him first. Amen. You just have to. I'd love to say, hey, put whatever you want in your gas tank. Drive around. Feel good. That's what religion and the world saying to everybody. Oh, you don't need God. You're a sissy, you Christians. Somebody said to me one time, he says... You Christians, Jesus is your crutch. And I looked at him, I started laughing. I used to, you think Jesus is my crutch? I'm using him for an excuse in my life. I want to tell you, I can't limp into heaven. Jesus is my stretcher. He carries me there. And the key is, you can't, again, we try to be good. How many trying to be good? How many found that you really can't at times? Hey, Romans 7, Paul says, I want to do good. I find myself constantly messing up. Yeah. Oh, the man that I want to be good, I, I cannot find. But what I see is a doofus. I just put it in modern terms. What he was saying is my flesh, even though I want it to do good, will rebel, will get crabby, will get irritable. So he says, who will deliver me from this problem that, that's everywhere with me? And God's, and he says, thank God through Jesus Christ, if you surrender daily to him, he'll quiet that monster down. Amen. Of course, you've seen a few of those little monsters, haven't you? In stores, throwing themselves down, having a tantrum. I got Now think about yourself for a minute. We never done that. All right, let's move right on. Okay, let me get to some really good things. Number one point I want to give you is that you are in a position that you are eternally taken care of, not by your own doing, but because you've accepted Jesus. And because you have accepted Jesus, the Father God says, because you have Jesus in you, I will favor you. Now, how many here, I don't mind to see you show of hands, ask Jesus to come into your heart. Doesn't matter what time. You ask Jesus, put your hands up because the devil's looking. Yeah, he's going to see if your hand's not up, then he's going to harass you. Amen. Yeah, you, you made Jesus. So listen, when you ask Jesus to come in, what did he do? And I'm going to play with you for just a minute to think. He actually came into your heart. So let me ask you, while Jesus is with you, how can the devil harass you so much? Because we're ignorant about what to say and do. Because we're ignorant of what we say and do. We don't realize we need to be trained biblically like the disciples were instead of religiously and be told not to do things and be told you better do things. You ever heard preaching like that? It's everywhere. That's not preaching. That's scolding. Hello? Preaching is, let me give you what you should do. Okay, so, here we go. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 4 through 6, please. Who, but God, who is rich in mercy, aren't you glad? 
because of his great love wherewith he loved us, even when you and I were dead in our trespasses and sins. He made us alive together with Christ. Say, I'm alive with Christ. Now look at somebody next to you and say, I'm alive with Christ. See, so confession is very important. You're alive with Christ. Who made you alive? God did. So you didn't do it, right? You prayed the prayer, but God made you alive in Christ. So why are we walking around like a dead person? Now, now I don't want you to condemn yourself, neither am I coming down on your case. I just want you to know that when we analyze ourselves with the Lord, God doesn't give us any condemnation. He just says, okay, you see that flaw there? Yes, Lord, boy, it's a big one. He says, I'm going to help you overcome it. God never leaves us with our problems. He always works with us about every shortcoming and every problem that we might have or potentially have. The key is you've got to remember that he's in you. And we go along in our day, oh, I forgot to pray. Oh, and you know, and then every somebody insults you, somebody does something. Now you find at the end of the day, you're all uptight, you're all upset. At your end of your day, that's when you should be able to rest because you met with God, not all stressed. Everyone say rest, not stress. Rest, not stress. And so the way we get rid of any hurts, any stresses, any problems is we meet with God. That's why the, the song said, though there be pain in the night, scriptures in Psalms, there'll be joy in the morning. Why? Because God has a chance to work it out in your heart. Amen. You see, because the enemy wants to make an impression on us that we're going to fail. He'll tell you, he'll have other people tell you, you're never going to amount to anything. I'm going to tell you this. There are people coming off drugs and off of alcohol, not because they know it's not good for them. They're coming off because Jesus is helping them. Amen. That's the key. Do you understand? You could have the strongest will and say, I'm going to quit smoking, but I got guarantee Satan knows the key to beating your will to death. So you don't say, God, I want to do this, but I can't do it on my own. And Jesus says, now we're going somewhere. Because you yoke up with me and I'll carry you into the future. You hook up with me. You walk in me. See, I'm going to try to teach you that you're complete in him. And I'll carry you through this life. I'm your shepherd. You should not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, not burnt ones. He leads me beside still waters. He doesn't lead me by the rapids where I get all torn up. He leads me by still water. What are still waters? Those are waters that run deeper and they're more refreshing. And he shall be in you a wellspring of water that shall spring up. If any man thirsty said, let him come unto me and drink, for out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the spirit which had not been poured out yet. Man, it's exciting. So catch this. But God was rich in mercy because of his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, he's made us alive together with Christ. Now, by grace, which is a gift, you have been saved. And raised us up. Now listen. He raised us up and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now we call this... It's really a, a weird term, but it's a term we need to understand as Christians. It's called positional truth. Everyone say, my position in Christ. You see, you have a position in the chair. So you're in the chair. I'm standing on the, you know. But in Christ, you're in heaven. Now answer me how that does. It's called a mystery of godliness. So the mystery of God of this is when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, not only does God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit come to live in your heart, 
But he takes your spirit and his spirit and mix them and makes you one. That's why you are a new creature in Christ. Not an old creature. Now there's two of you. There's your old person. The one that you have to bathe and feed. And there's your new person. The one that walks with Jesus. Which one are you paying most attention to? That's the key. Whatever we pay most attention to gets the attention. So, of course, all of us know better. We put our attention on God first, and he helps us with our thinking, with our actions, all during the day. Then at the end, thank him. God, thank you for this great day and all the wonderful things you did, especially the ones I didn't notice. And, Lord, so good night. Let's you and I sleep. You'll be awake watching over me, but I'll be asleep resting in you. And see, we came from God, and truly, if we can help it, we will go back to him. Amen. Jesus said to his disciples, we are going to the other side. And so a storm rose up, and what did the disciples do? They forgot what Jesus said, and they started freaking out. Oh, we're going to perish, we're going to perish. Where was Jesus? He was asleep in the boat. I think he was real nervous, wasn't he? Jesus lives in your heart. There isn't anything that you're going to experience that's going to make God nervous. The key is bring him in here out where he can control your thinking and your walking. And believe me, people will come to you for advice. They'll say, what in the world happened? You know what happened to me? When I got saved, they came to me and they said, what in the world happened to you? Did you get religion? And I looked at him, I says, no, I got Jesus. Amen. And he got me. And they laughed and made fun of me. But in about three months, you know, where were they coming for answers? To me. Because my life suddenly now is stable. I am suddenly know where I'm going. I know who lives in me. I found out what God has given me. And I, I appear stable and confident, not by my own doing, but by the grace of God. He makes me strong. He puts my feet on a rock. Amen. I don't do it on my own. I just surrender to him daily. And let him tell me what my day is going to fulfill. And the rest have fun with him. Woo. I still like to jam on my drums and rock and roll. But I do it for God. There needs to be new fresh leaders standing up and saying, world. There's another alternative. His name is God. And you know what, world? He's the coolest, coolest person you'll ever meet. You see, when we're religious, we lose touch with others. But when we have a fresh relationship with God, we're in touch with others. Amen? Woo. How would you like to just put your, you know, just say one of your friends, man, God loves you, and suddenly they get healed. Happens to me many times. It constantly happens to me. I was raised in a church in a believing situation where miracles were a part of everyday happening. This is your God who lives in you. So why are we doing the religious thing? Mom dragged us to church again. <laughs> I, the only time I went to church before I was saved was at weddings and a funeral. And mom dragged me to all of them. Now, I'm just teasing you because, listen, there has to come a time we, we want to be with Jesus. We want to be with God's people. Not so we can become religious or not cool, so that we can excel. Did you know that every invention in the world, every vaccine that's worked, every medicine, every invention that has helped mankind, all were invented by Christians? You can actually look it up. All the inventions that has caused harm, bombs, nuclear, all came from people that denied God exists. So the world is broken up into two entities. Everyone say two. Yeah. Looks like I'm saying peace. Okay. I'm just... Remember, I'm a human first, and then I'm a pastor. But listen, two entities. Satan thinks, now listen carefully, he's the God of this world. So he has an entire system 
that teaches people, remember we're the persons that have to deal with the two entities, the, uh, the devil and God. We have to make a choice. And the longer you wait, the harder the choice will be. Make it when you're young. And say, God, help me along the way, because I'm young. But nevertheless, Satan has a kingdom. He thinks it's his. So next week, we're going to teach intense spiritual warfare for you. But we're going to do it in such a way that it'll get you to put a skip in your heels and a jump in, in your step. Because we're going to show you how to war God's way instead of what people have been teaching. But first of all, let me just tell you, Satan's already been defeated. Okay, now you, you think about that. Well, why is all this mess going on then, Pastor Kerry? Because we have to declare his defeat. Huh? What do you mean? We have to say Satan's defeated in my life because Jesus has become Lord. Yeah. Then what happens is you get God adjusts your hearing so you don't hear the lies so intensely anymore. You start hearing the still small voice of your shepherd. All right. Say, I got this so far. All right. So remember, God raised you up. Now you're sitting with God in heavenly places. Now, you're not aware of it because we're aware of our surroundings because we're natural. But inside your spirit, you are connected to God in heavenly places. That means you don't have to try to get God to do things. You just open your heart and let him flow to do things justly. For example, if you don't like the way things are going, maybe at, at your job, Ask God to flow into there and change the thinking of the people working there. Don't go, oh God, why did you put me here? I bind the devil. I can't be blah, 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 blah. Oh, and take me out of this God awful place. What if God puts you in there to give them light? And you just ask God to remove the light, the only hope they have. So we got to get a new perspective of why we are in this earth. We're in this earth to be salt and light. We're in this world to be a witness. We're in this world to show others as another alternative to listen to other than the God of this world. And so when Jesus came, he bound up the devil. And he bound him up in such a way that he has not put all of him under his feet yet. Why? It's really simple. God wants us to choose which we're going to serve. Let me ask you, who's on the Lord's side? Who's on the Lord's side? I'm on the... Amen. So there's constant choice making going on. Satan says, oh, no, I can, I can take Pastor Kerry, and I can go ahead and I can seduce him and get him to turn away from God. Too late. Too late. I had that happen when I was young. Okay. But now that I'm an olden, it's too late. I'm too in love with Jesus to give him up for anything. All right. So, first of all, know that you are crucified with Christ. So, I'm going to give you some steps. We are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live. Yet not us now, but Christ who lives in our spirit or in us. And the life we now live, we live by faith. How many here can tell what tomorrow's going to bring? You can't without faith. With, with faith in God, you know tomorrow's going to be a good day, whether it rains or snows. But without faith looking for tomorrow, it's unsure. So lift your eyes a little higher. Put your faith in the Lord. Because... Take no thought, anxious thought for tomorrow. For when you get into tomorrow, God and you will conquer that too. The key is Satan's got us so messed up as a church worldwide that they're living for God in their own strength and failing at it. How many, how many knows? Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. So when you ask Jesus to come in your heart, let him take control. 
Say amen. amen. I don't know about you, but when you're in towns like Germany, where I was, and in New York, where you, the traffic is just awful, I'd rather have somebody drive me. Amen. Right? Amen. Take a taxi. Amen. You know, just don't touch anything in the back seat, you know. Take a taxi. Why? Because you'll leave the driving to someone that knows the place. Amen. Folks, get in the Jesus taxi. He knows everything, every in and out about everything. Get in the taxi, buckle up, and let God drive your life. Amen. Let him steer, let him guide you. Yeah. All right. So say, I'm crucified with Christ, yet I live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Now you see the two, the old man and the new man, the old man and the new man. Which one's winning? The one you feed the most. Old man or the new man? The old man or the new man? The crabby person, the sassy person, or the sweet little child of God? Amen. So Romans 6 says this. Or do you not know that as many as have received Jesus Christ were baptized into Christ? They were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with Christ when he died through baptism into death. And just as Christ rose from the dead when we accept him, he raises us up and we sit together with him in heavenly places. So, here's the key. But right now, all you can feel, all you can see is you. But the scripture says, but you're also in heaven. Now, which source is an unlimited source? God who lives in you. Which source is a limited source? Your flesh and your ability to come up with an answer. God's always our source. Can you say amen? So he says, now, you died with Jesus, but also you raised with Jesus. Now, Galatians says, I have been crucified with Christ, but don't run your life. Turn it over to God. Hello. Hello. Somebody says, well, I bought this car, but it turned out to be an awful lemon. I like to say, did you pray and ask God? Well, no, I, I, I really didn't. Well, then don't blame God for a bad car. <laughs> now, you say, well, that's just a silly example. Well, yes, think about it. Scripture says, Lord, I love this woman. She's up. Fox, God. He just, <laughs> I gotta have this lady. Work it out, God. All the time you're hearing, she's not the woman for you. She's not the one. But God, look how she looks. 24, 36, 41. You know, it's just, oh man. See, we're, we're fixed on what we see. See. But you see, God knows what's in that woman. No offense, ladies, or guy, okay? He knows what's in that person, right? Okay. And so the Bible says, before you go out and make major decisions in your life, would you come and ask me so I can guide you? Amen. So I don't know about you, but there's only one car I bought in my life that I didn't pray about. And I wish I would have. We'll leave it at that. Amen. And for those who, who have gone through the hardship of like a divorce or something like that, and listen, God forgives sin, but it's usually because they didn't really either know God when they got married or they got married like I did in happened circumstances. And the first two years that I was married, you'll get a kick out of this, I didn't sober up till the first two years of my marriage. And then I realized the person I married, I didn't even like so sometimes you can get as bad as I was. Now, was she a bad person? No. But see, I needed the wisdom of God so he could see if it's going to work out. Why don't we have patience to let God work something out in our life? And we, but we got to have it now. Yeah, but nobody told you that it has a, cla a cracked block. And you bought that Mustang with a cracked block, and now you have to buy another one. You see? And so, rather than plow on in life 
wondering what's going to happen tomorrow, you have the God who knows living on the inside of you. Now, here's the key. Many Christians are under a certain amount of stresses and frustration that, and here's one I have to be careful of, that we bring on ourselves. Hello. Whether it be wrong teaching or bad understanding of who God might be. Did you know that you could have a misconception about God? That's why we need to search the scripture and make sure our understanding about God is the way he describes himself and not the way we think he is. Amen. Because the way I thought God was, if I did anything wrong, he was going to open up something and smack me. <laughs> and then I had these old aunts that loved God, but they didn't have any Bible teaching. They told me whenever I broke my arm or my leg, God was punishing me. Folks, you've got God on the inside of you. Why would God punish himself? You see, so Satan's crazy at teaching weird stuff that is sounds scriptural, but is not. And we have to be careful that we go to a good church where the word is being taught, not religion, Amen. not self-condemnation. Here, nobody's a, a phony here. We have some sleepy people here. We have some older people here, but nobody's a phony here. Nobody's going to judge you. Nobody's going to do it. We're all going to love each other and become strong. And if you're a younger person, we're going to see that you get the best care. And if you're an older person, it's going to get the best care. But church is not Jesus. We only represent him. So guess what? Church isn't the answer for everything. You have a home life. You have a personal life. But for Linda and I, who, who are pastors here, it's our entire life. So don't compare lives with others either. Here, I'm dedicated. I'm like an altar worker. I'm, I'm right here. This is part of these five acres. This is a part of my livelihood. But what I'm doing is serving God. And so everything that is under my care and my wife's care has now been placed back into God's care. And look what he's doing with it. Amen. 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 And look what he can do with you. Just think for a moment. Because he lives in you and he loves you. And just forget that you make mistakes. You, you know, a little baby makes mistakes, might throw up on you. But you don't throw the baby down and say, go away. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, that's what you've been told is Christianity. If you're a bad person, get away from me. That's not God. That's man trying to be like God. It doesn't work. All right. Say, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Okay, let's just imagine. I'm going to paint a little picture. God's got me on this point, so he won't let me off of it. So the point is, you've got to realize God being in you, no one is going to mess with you when you let God run your life. How many, can you imagine, can you imagine who would be maybe in your eyes the strongest person in the world? Maybe the biggest wrestler or Mr. Kung Fu, whoever, and you and this person are walking down the trail, okay? And some guy jumps out and says, blah, 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 I'm going to get you, and you smile and say, take care of him for me. <laughs> he goes over there, top, 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 pop, pop, and then the guy's crying, please leave me alone. That's what God will do to the devil if you let Jesus handle your situation. Because you're walking with someone every day of your life has never tasted defeat and knows no defeat. But we don't let him take control. We're busy walking for God. Working hard, trying to be good. Now, I know I'm making fun of it, but that was me. And God said to me one time, many times, Carrie, what are you doing? Lord, I'm trying to keep my word to you. And he says, you can't. Why don't you let me in you keep your word to me? Why don't you let me guide your steps so you don't make a bad one? Why don't you relax more and stop being so uptight because you keep falling short of your efforts? 
And why don't you read the scripture where it says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, and I will cause you to overcome if you just get out of the way and let me rule in your life. Hello? I love God when he talks to me that way. How'd you feel after he chewed you out, Pastor Kerry? He never chooses anyone out. He always talks to you, especially when he wants to correct me. You know what he says? Kerry, I love you. <laughs> but there's a couple of things I need you to work on, and I'll work on them with you. Okay, so let's go on. So we found out we're crucified with Christ. So if we're crucified with Christ, then who lives in us? So stop digging up your old person. Amen. Say amen. amen. Here's my next point. My next point is you are seated in Christ in heavenly places. Amen. Where does it say that? Well, it says in Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 3. If then you are raised with Christ, seek, look after, and follow after those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of, the, of God. Set your mind on a... chocolate Sunday. <laughs> now, let me say it again. I'm going to show you something. Chocolate Sunday. Now, you might not like them, but for those that like them, when you hear words like that, suddenly, what do you think about yeah, that's the way we were made. So when the enemy throws something at you like you'll never amount to anything, don't treat it like a chocolate sundae. And dwell on it till you get one. Amen. Come on, you know I'm preaching real good here. And that's what the enemy does. He, he tells you, you're this, you're that, nobody likes you. You're, your best friend is talking behind your back. Chip, 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 and now your mind is focused on the wrong chocolate Sunday. Okay. Well, I got that, Pastor Kerry. Well, God gave you a chocolate Sunday to think about, not the other. So what did he give us? I want to show you. You set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. That's a big, big description. Politics, get your eyes off of Get your eyes off of what everybody else is doing. Put your eyes on Jesus and ask him what you should be doing and enjoy the rest of your time with him. God is into you laughing. He's into you playing. He's into you enjoying your life to the fullest, but not being irresponsible and letting the devil in to steal your joy. Come on now. Are you saying, Pastor Kerry, I'm not going to go through hard times? Oh, you're going to go through them. Satan will see to that. But you can go through them with joy with God and have them not scar you. Or you can constantly set your mind on, why me? Why am I going through these things? And if you're sitting here thinking I'm making the sermon up just about you, please don't put me under that. I, I don't do that. I don't preach to people. I preach up at people hoping it's going to fall down and somebody's going to pull truth out of that shower. Can you say amen? But it will be descriptive. I might describe either one of us. That's called conviction. All right, so, and finishing up with you. Catch this. If you are risen with Christ, say, I am. Where do we put our eyes? Amen. Not on the world, right? Amen. Not on others, right? Amen. And not on ourselves, right? Amen. 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 Put them on Jesus. Amen. Set yourself, for you died. Everyone say, I died. I died. I died. I died. See, the terminology means that your selfishness, being totally about you, me, 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 is to die. Because the me problem is the biggest problem we have. It's either God's will or me will. So we got to ask God to help us crucify. For you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ. Say, I'm hidden with Christ. Hidden with Christ. In God. All right, folks, let me describe it. 
How many has ever seen somebody dress up in a wonderful costume? You couldn't even recognize them. And you go, whoa, that's pretty cool. My mom did that to me, did that to me when I was younger. I'll explain some other day. But what you got to realize is when it says your life is hidden with Christ in God, according to what the scripture says. Now listen to me. How many has ever seen some Star Wars? Yeah, come on. Where the little tube comes down and they go off somewhere else. Star Trek 2. Yeah, sorry, it's Star Trek. Yeah, Star Wars, Star... I don't know, it's been so long. But anyway, remember all of those little ideas? Well, think about it in that way. When you say, Jesus, the enemy's trying to harass me, so Jesus, I put on the whole type of armor, suddenly what happens, the enemy looks in the realm of the spirit. And while we are acting like us, he sees us. But when we say, Jesus... I'm hidden with you in God. Suddenly, in Jesus' name, Jesus covers us like a costume, like a dome. And Satan doesn't see us anymore. I'm telling you the truth. I'll stake my life on this. This is what Christians don't understand. When you are get up from your prayer time in the morning, Satan doesn't see you. He sees Jesus. He sees the Jesus in you. But listen to me carefully. It's not till we go through the day that something happens, we open our mouth and describe. It's not Jesus, it's me. <laughs> what do you do then? And the devil goes, How did I miss that? It's scary. He went and made, said something stupid. I know it's him. God never says anything stupid. I'm trying to make fun, just so you understand. This is, I'm not putting him, but. This is how I understand things in pictures. So what happens is, what, what should we do? We start off, we're covered in Christ. God's got us all. We're, we're doing great. But around noon, some stuff starts to happen. Well, instead of you trying to figure out what happened, just stop for a minute, say, Father, in Jesus' name, and then you're cloaked again. You see, Satan's got us on a works program. If you blow it, it's going to take you two or three days to be repentant. Ask God to forgive you. And then if you feel better, go back to church. What a religious lie that is. Number one, no matter what you do, if you don't, you just did a mistake, God looks at you as a child that makes a mistake. Moms, dads, did you throw your children away when they didn't clean the room? No. Did you throw the baby out with the bathwater when he knocked over your canister? Yeah. Why, why do we think God's going to toss us away when we stumble in our life learning about living for God? Amen. He is not. Don't let the enemy steal your joy or give you a lie or rip you off one way or the other. God loves you with all of his love. He so loved that he gave his son. So this idea, oh, God doesn't love me anymore. Boy, I tell you, you're going to get the devil off your back, man, because that's who's telling you that. Whew, I'm preaching to the audience over here. So the scripture says the truth. But reality has another truth. There are two truths. There's the truth what the Bible says, and there's the truth which you are experiencing. Well, what do you do about that? You hold to the Bible truth, and the other experience, you begin to ask God for wisdom. Well, why that is what it's doing? Why is there still problems in my finances? And you might say, well, Lord, why is there? It just seems like by the time I get ahead, another bill shows up. And Why is it? You get together with God and you say, why is it? And God says, because you don't put me first in your finances. First bill you pay, it's not a bill, is your tithes, your giving. Why? It's the only, now listen to me carefully. I'm not trying to be religious to you. I'm not, I don't want your money. If none of you gave, for the rest of my life, this church will continue to go. So I'm not accounting on your giving. But listen, 
God wants you to, so he has something to work with. you got to put something in God's hands so he can work with it. You put your life in his hands, right? Right? How many here's made you a champion? So here's what happens. We put our life in God's hands, and after a couple of weeks, we start taking it back. Now listen, it's not make, to make you feel, I'm just describing us. So that's why pastor's telling you, you meet with God every day. So that it doesn't get, the enemy doesn't play with you so hard. Okay? We are living in a cesspool, folks. This is a dangerous world. It's also very beautiful. Hello? So if it's beautiful, don't step in the crocodile's mouth. Enjoy the water, but don't go swimming with the piranha. <clears throat> hey, he makes sense. What's wrong with him? He's a preacher. He's making sense. Listen, it's all about you and I living before God because he has an entire eternity for us. Don't spend your jubers right here on this planet. What do you mean by jubers? Don't throw all your marbles on this planet. It's going to be changed. It's going to be renovated. But the Bible says you're going to live forever. So, I certainly don't want to invest in something temporary. Okay, let me finish up with you. He's been saying that for half an hour. All right. Okay. I want you to listen to what God's word says to you. This is in Romans 8, verse 31. Now, I skipped a scripture just a minute. I want you to just hear this, and then we're going to go back to 1 John chapter 1, okay? Romans 8, 31 says, What shall we say to these things that come against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Everyone say amen. amen. Then it says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. See, God is the giver. He's the giver of all things perfect and good. So you can tell right now, if it's not perfect and good, it didn't come from him. Maybe it came from man or the intention was there. But now go with me and let me show you how to walk in such a way that it'll scare the iniquity out of the devil. You ready? I mean, this is the Bible I'm sharing with you. This is not my opinion. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 and 7. I want you to listen to this. Everyone say the message, the message. is the gospel. And the gospel is the message. So now you'll understand when I read. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Everyone say in him. Amen. So let me ask you this question. If you're in your car, where are you? Ah, isn't that it? That's amazing. And if you're in church, where are you? If you're in Christ, where are you? So why don't you walk that way? Come on, I'm just, what I'm doing is sharing you, we can walk that way. It's not hard, it's not difficult, but it's what the devil wants us to think. Oh, it's hard to walk that way. No, it's not. Just let God do the walking. God, what do you want you and I to do this morning? Well, let's just spend some time together, and then I'll lay out your day for you. Well, that's great. Takes away worry, takes away fear, takes away all that, and you know God's in control. Man, i certainly rather have God flying the plane than myself. This is the message we have heard from here and declare unto you. This is the message. God is light and in him, in him is what? No darkness at all. So somebody tells you God's doing this. God's putting you through this to teach you something. You can smile at him and say you're deceived. God's light and in him is no dark. Sickness is darkness, folks. Depression is darkness. Anything that pulls you away from God, makes you think only about yourself, is darkness. 
And when you're dwelling in God, you're full of light. So you could be out of God or in God. Which one will you choose? Well, I'm in God right now, but where's your attention? Out of God. You're busy watching this goofball up here. <laughs> Bless your heart. No, we're actually two people. So we could come to church in the flesh and get nothing out of it. When we come to church in the spirit, and even if somebody drops their pencil, whoa, I got a spiritual lesson out of that. You, you might laugh at me, but I'm not. I went to a church where it was just in a home. And the first day I went, I watched a whole row of teeth straighten up in front of 30 people. And I went, wow, I want to know that God. You see, if you're not seeing miracles, signs, and wonders, if you're not experiencing that, then let's get you a place in your walk where you do. Because it's promised to every believer, these signs shall follow them that believe. Amen? Yeah. Whew, done preach myself happy. Now let's get into this. You're kidding me. So it's walk in the light. Okay. Now look at verse 7. But if we walk in the light, everyone say, it's my choice. If we walk in God, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ covers all our boo-boos, covers all our sins. See, when we meet with God, walk with God, God constantly is cleansing us. So that when we do make a mistake, God doesn't check it off and say, Oh, stop everything. Let's deal with this. No. He gets you to a place where after a while, you don't do that anymore. We used to get blamed a lot for teaching things like this about really focusing on God. People used to say, well, you're just giving people a license to sin. I said, no, they're going to sin without a license. People make mistakes all the time. And then we got a wrong idea what sin is. Sin is a very destructive term. It simply means a selfish decision that displeases God. Missing the mark. So there are two people. People who sin who don't know God. The judgment is stronger. But to the Christian who makes a mistake, which is sin, God deals as with sons. So you don't throw the baby out by making a boo-boo. You don't scream and yell at the baby for crying. Hello? Amen. And so God doesn't treat us that way. But the key is Satan has got us thinking, but you did something wrong. Everybody's going to know if you come to church. Nobody here has the nerve to judge you. We don't want to come under the same junk. We rather love you for who God loves you as and let him change you into that. It's not my job to pick on your faults. Amen. Parents maybe, but not pastors. Okay. I know what's wrong with you. You need to do, no, no. <laughs> All right. Now, finish up, up with you. It's very important. We have been established and totally covered. And so instead of just reading from the notes, you'll have them up here. Okay? We're established and covered. So say, I'm established in Christ. Now, how many here know that in Galatians 5, verse 22, you might write it down. But I, I, I'm just going to expound on it and then close up with this. When we accept Jesus Christ, you have the fruit of the Spirit in you. Everyone say, fruit of the Spirit. Notice it doesn't say fruits of the Spirit. It says fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, gentleness, temperance, and faithfulness. Nine sections. So the fruit that you have in you is Jesus. And the way people can see that you have a love affair and that you love God, is they should be able to see the fruit on your branches. They should see, number one, you're loving instead of crabby. Amen. I'm just going to be fun with us, but you have all this fruit in you, but it's got to come out. 
So you'll be loving. You'll be joyous instead of frustrated. These fruits are right in you. You'll have peace beyond understanding. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Suffering long. No. Long-suffering is the quality of God in you that tells you not to give up even when it seems like everything is coming down. Amen. Why? Because God doesn't know defeat and he lives in you. Amen. So he suffers long with you until you understand how to work with him. Long suffering, meekness. Everyone here say the meek one's in me. Meek Notice it doesn't say weak one. It says meek one. See, meek means that you might have, and I, I describe this a lot. You might be a big, burly person, real strong. But a meek person doesn't have to show everybody how strong they are all the time. They show how, you see, the bigger you are, the softer you should be. You ever notice that the small cut-off people are usually the crabbiest? Yeah, I mean, notice it. If you're going to look at society for a minute, you'll find out the big guys that have been humbled or gentle and soft, you know, most of the time. And you'll find the little guys are always fighting for attention and everything like that. There's Henri as all can be. And let me just, you can laugh at this. Paul was a little guy. He was a good scrapper about God. Wrote more than two-thirds of the New Testament. So have you got this now? How many of you got something out of this service that really ministered to you? Good. See, that means that you are listening. And listen, God has such great plans for all of us. But we have to spend time with him for him to show us. Can you say amen? amen. All right. So it, look what it says. Um, we're going to drop down to the seven again. And we walk in the light so the blood of Jesus constantly cleanses us. So we don't have to be worrying about making mistakes so much as just making sure we meet with God so he's in charge. And then Romans, I want you to look at this one. This is Romans 13, 11 through 14, okay? We are established and covered. So as being established with the fruit of the Spirit, it says, and do this knowing the time. How many here know what time it is? Well, we know that it, what is it, uh, 11, almost 11.40. But the time in in which we live, it's 11.30, real close to Jesus coming. Everything is upside down and backwards. That's why God says, take your eyes off the world. Take them off of politics, off of others. Why? Because it's all unstable. And if you get your eyes focused on that, your Sunday will turn into a headache burger. Okay. So we have the fruit of the Spirit. Can you say amen? amen? But look at the last part of this. If we live in the Spirit, we can. Let us also walk in the Spirit. So say, I have the fruit of the Spirit in me. I'm full, of it. I'm full of it. There you go. In Jesus' name. Now we're covered also. Go with me to Ephesians 6. I'm just going to give you a familiar scripture. How many here know there's armor of God? Amen. And God is a spirit. So his armor is what? Spiritual. Okay. Now, when I was first taught the Bible, I was taught to put on the armor of God. So guess what I did, everybody? I started adjusting my head, trying to get my belt fixed right so my pants don't fall down. And holding on the breastplate of righteousness, right? We want to make sure the armor's on there good. But you know what God said? He's said, Carrie, what are you doing? I'm putting on the armor. He says, you don't put it on. I put it on you. So when it says, put on the whole armor of God, you go, Father, in Jesus' name, put the armor on me. Yeah. Boom, it comes crumbling down. Boom, 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 boom,
You don't have to try to get your mind to think the right things. The moment you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, your mind suddenly goes click. Okay, we're focused on Jesus now. You're that person to meet with God first thing in the morning for a short time. He's already straightened you out. Amen? So you get up and you say, thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, and you now have the armor on you. Not only are you filled with God, you have the fruit of the Spirit, but you have the armor all over you. Satan doesn't see you. He sees that armor that looks just like Jesus. Now, when Satan came to Jesus, did he come to Jesus? Yes. Did he tempt Jesus? Yes. But how did Jesus handle that? He just answered by scripture. Do you know how you battle the devil's lies? Answer by scripture. Say, sorry, Satan, I don't believe anything you say. Scripture says. That's why pastors, good ones, try to get you in the word to know enough that when the enemy tries to lay a heavy rebbe on you, you can just simply answer him with scripture. Because in the beginning was what? The word and the word was? with God and the word was God so when you speak the word you're speaking God Amen. if you got something out of that this morning would you give the Lord a hand clap